In the 1970s, one of the most glamorous careers you could have was working in the airline industry. Advertisers bombarded consumers with images of beautiful stewardesses serving passengers gourmet food while handsome, quick-thinking pilots expertly navigated them to their destinations. Airlines really wanted to push the idea of air travel being this fun and exciting way to get where you were going, making it sound like something that would rival even a luxury cruise liner. The reality of this, however, was much more mundane. You were likely to spend more time listening to the guy next to you snore than you would chatting up the attractive flight attendant. No one understood this more than the people who worked on these airlines themselves. This was a job with long hours that saw them flying all over the country on a daily basis. Regardless of how sexy magazine ads tried to make it look, the truth was working at an airline was pretty boring. On November 24, 1971, the crew of Northwest Airlines Flight 305 arrived at the Portland International Airport expecting another one of these boring days. They climbed into their Boeing 727-100 and began making preparations for passengers to arrive. Among them were flight attendants Florence Schaffner and Tina Mucklow, as well as Captain William Scott, First Officer Bill Radizak, and First Engineer Harold Anderson. They were getting ready for a routine flight to Seattle, Washington, which even by the most conservative of estimations would take them barely half an hour. As passengers boarded the plane, a man in his mid-40s dressed in business attire with a black tie whose ticket read Dan Cooper made his way to his seat and sat down in the middle of the row. He ordered a bourbon and soda, then smoked a cigarette while patiently awaiting for the flight to begin. Shortly before 3 p.m., Flight 305 began to take off headed for Seattle. And as the plane was headed down the runway, Mr. Cooper took a note out of his pocket and handed it to Miss Schaffner, who was walking past his seat. Florence, an attractive 23-year-old, was no stranger to men flirting with her or giving their phone numbers out, so she simply assumed this was the case and dropped the note in her pocket without thinking much about it. Moments later, though, as she walked past his seat a second time, the man leaned over and whispered to her, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. The bewildered young stewardess walked to the plane's galley and took the note out of her pocket to read, showing it to her co-worker, Miss Mucklow, as she did. According to both women, it simply stated, I have a bomb, come sit next to me. But the exact wording of the note is unknown, as Cooper would reclaim it a short time later. The understandably terrified flight attendant did as he asked. Cooper opened up his briefcase to reveal what appeared to be six sticks of dynamite wired to a detonator. He then started making a list of demands. $200,000 in what he described as, quote, negotiable American currency, two sets of parachutes, and a refueling truck awaiting them in Seattle. Tina came over to the two and also saw the contents of the briefcase, and then went to the intercom system to contact the cockpit. As the aircraft was just lifting off the runway, the pilots were informed of the shocking news that their plane had been hijacked. Now, for context, it's important to note that hijackings were an all-too-common occurrence during the late 60s and early 70s. Many of these involved Cuban nationals who were fleeing the U.S. searching for political asylum. One famous case involved a man who hijacked a Boeing 747 and made it all the way to Cuba, making it the first time a 747 ever landed in the country. The captain was even greeted by Fidel Castro, who asked him some questions about the plane before seeing them off back to the U.S. Other times these hijackings were brought on by mental illness, such as when an American man stormed the cockpit of an Eastern Airlines flight with a 38 caliber pistol, shooting and mortally wounding the co-pilot and also wounding the captain in his arm. Despite having wounds that would eventually kill him, the co-pilot managed to wrestle the gun away from the hijacker and shot him three times before falling unconscious. 
The captain, with a gunshot wound to his arm, managed to land the flight successfully while fighting off the wounded hijacker who was attempting to force a crash. The perpetrator was taken into custody and would later commit suicide in jail. All this is to say, if you were a pilot or crew for an airline at this time in history, you were well aware that this was something you could have a chance of being faced with. And since this was a pre-9-11 world, there were no air marshals on board to try and save you. After realizing what was happening, the pilots immediately contacted air traffic control and relayed the situation along with the list of Mr. Cooper's demands. The control tower contacted local authorities as well as the owner of Northwest Airlines, who made it clear to the crew they were to cooperate with the hijacker's demands and authorized the money to be gathered for the ransom payment. Seattle police contacted the local FBI office, who quickly assembled a team to meet the aircraft when it landed at the Seattle-Tacoma airport. The parachutes were obtained from a local businessman named Earl Kosey, or Kasi, I'm not sure which. I mean, is it even a crime spot video if I don't horribly butcher somebody's name at some point anyway? In order to give people working on the ground time to get everything together, the plane went into a holding pattern, or circling as it's commonly referred to. The pilots made an announcement to passengers that this was due to a minor mechanical error since they didn't want to start a panic. Miss Muckler returned to Miss Schaffner and Mr. Cooper and noticed he was now wearing a dark pair of sunglasses, presumably to make it harder to identify him. Being the more experienced flight attendant, she offered to take Florence's spot sitting next to him. She noted that Cooper did not match what she imagined a hijacker would be like. He was very polite and cordial with her and the rest of the staff, tipping Miss Schaffner an extra $18 for his bourbon and even offering to pay for the crew's dinner after landing in Seattle. The two conversed during much of the time the flight was circling around, with Cooper pointing out things that made it seem like he knew the area, such as the location of nearby McCord Air Force Base. Tina asked him if he had a grudge with the airline and if that's why he was doing this, to which he responded, no, I just have a grudge. Miss Muckler remarked that he seemed very calm throughout the whole ordeal, ordering another bourbon and smoking several cigarettes as they waited to finally land. On the ground, responders were scrambling through the chaotic process of getting all the items Mr. Cooper had demanded together. 10,000 unmarked $20 bills were obtained from several banks in the area. Cooper had requested non-sequential serial numbers on the bills, but police officers made sure to take microfilm photos of each one so they could later track Cooper if he attempted to spend the money. All of the serial numbers also started with the letter L to make tracking them a bit easier. The parachutes ended up being more of an issue. McCord Air Force Base offered to provide military issue ones, but Cooper declined insisting that he wanted civilian chutes with user operated rip cords. His request for the second set of parachutes led officers to believe he intended on taking a hostage with him, which dissuaded the FBI from sabotaging the chutes before handing them over. The teams on the ground also considered storming the plane to try and take Mr. Cooper in, because to them it sounded like the sticks of dynamite used to make the bomb were probably fake. They ultimately decided against this though, as the risk of civilian casualties if they were wrong was too great. Once everything was in place, air traffic control contacted Flight 305 and informed them they were ready for them to land. Just after 5.30 p.m., the aircraft landed on a remote but well-lit section of the Seattle-Tacoma Airport's runway. Cooper ordered all the curtains to be drawn, as he didn't want to risk being shot by snipers. He also had the cabin lights dimmed and made it clear that he didn't want any vehicles aside from the refueling trucks approaching the plane. He demanded that the person bringing the money and parachutes come alone, and agreed to release the passengers along with most of the crew once the items were in his possession. A Northwest Airline employee was brought to the plane with the items Mr. Cooper had requested, and Miss Mucklow was ordered to lower the staircase. The employee then handed over both sets of parachutes and the bank bag full of money to her. Once he had the items, 
Cooper allowed the 35 passengers on board, as well as the entire crew except for the three pilots and Tina to be taken off the plane. As the aircraft began refueling, Mr. Cooper started discussing the next phase of his plan with the remaining crew on board. It was here he displayed an extremely thorough knowledge of the Boeing 727-100. He set very specific instructions for how they would fly once they left Seattle. Keep the plane under 10,000 feet, the airspeed at less than 150 knots, the landing gear deployed, the wing flaps lowered to 15 degrees, and the cabin depressurized. He knew the lightweight jet could fly under such conditions without stalling, and flying at that height and velocity would make for an easy jump to an experienced skydiver. He initially wanted the plane to take off with the aft staircase lowered. However, Northwest Airline officials were adamantly against this, insisting it would be a safety issue. Mr. Cooper argued that it would be fine, but eventually relented and agreed to lower it once the plane was in the air. The exact instructions for how the plane would fly had been agreed upon, but where the flight would go after takeoff was a much different matter. Cooper wanted the plane to fly to Mexico, however the pilots informed him that it wouldn't be possible for them to travel that far in one trip and they would need to stop and refuel again. After some debate, they agreed to stop for fuel in Reno, Nevada. As they waited for the plane to finish refueling, Cooper became visibly agitated for the first time during the incident. An FAA official requested to come on board alone and meet with him face to face, an offer that was flatly rejected. Furthermore, the plane was taking much longer to get fueled than it should have. Cooper actually knew exactly how much fuel the airplane could take in per minute, and had calculated that it shouldn't take more than 15 minutes to fill up the plane. What he hadn't calculated though was a vapor lock occurring in one of the trucks, which resulted in a second truck needing to be brought in to finish the process up. Mr. Cooper was not happy about this, and for the first time cracks in his polite and calm demeanor began to show. The crew on the ground double timed it to get the plane fueled and ready to fly, because, you know, an angry dude who is carrying a potential bomb with four other people on a plane is not a good combination. Soon after the cruise finished up and at 7.40 p.m. Flight 305 took off once again. Two fighter jets were called in from McCord Air Force Base and told to follow behind the aircraft, but to stay out of Cooper's sight. Inside of the plane, Miss Mucklow was still seated next to Mr. Cooper and observed him taking the bundles of money out of the bag and wrapping them inside of one of the parachutes. He then took the chute and tied it up into a bundle before securing it around his waist. After this, he asked her to open the door that led to the air stairs and lower them for him. But Tina was visibly nervous at the idea, so Cooper told her he would do it himself and ordered her to go up front to the cockpit and stay inside. Miss Mucklow entered the cockpit and sat patiently with the pilots awaiting what would come next. Shortly after 8pm, the four of them heard a loud noise fill the cabin, and a flashing red light came on indicating Cooper had opened the door leading to the air stairs. Moments later, a muffled voice came across the intercom telling the pilots to slow down further, as Mr. Cooper couldn't get the stairs to drop. They did as requested and asked him if he needed any more help, to which he replied no rather angrily. This was the last time anyone would speak with the mysterious man known as Dan Cooper. At 8.24pm with Flight 305 25 miles north of Portland, the crew felt the plane shake with a violent bump. They instinctively knew this was the sound of the air stairs bouncing back up inside the plane. There weren't any cameras or a window in the cockpit door for them to see out of and they didn't want to anger him by opening the door, but they had a strong feeling that Mr. Cooper had parachuted out of the plane, and First Officer Radizak sent a message to air traffic control for them to mark their screens. Indeed, he was correct. Dan Cooper had jumped out into the cold stormy night, and the mystery of who he was and why he'd done what he had was only beginning. At 10.15 p.m., Flight 305 landed in Reno, Nevada, with the remaining crew on board all safe and accounted for. There were no signs of Cooper, except for the black tie he had worn, eight cigarette butts, and one of the sets of parachutes which had a suspension cord removed from it. 
Police quickly began processing the scene for physical evidence, recovering 66 sets of fingerprints, though none of them could be conclusively linked to the hijacker. The two flight attendants who'd spent the most time with Mr. Cooper worked closely with FBI artists on a series of composite sketches that were quickly released to the public, producing the now famous drawings. Due to the pilot's prompt transmission after what they believed was Cooper's jump, police had a good idea of the general area they were in at the time he dove from the plane. The problem was, this was still a huge stretch of land that was mostly covered in forest, and the particularly cold and rainy conditions that night coupled with the terrain caused a delay in when search operations could begin. From the start though, police were skeptical of the idea that Mr. Cooper had even survived the jump. Not only was he nowhere near appropriately dressed to trek through a vast frozen wilderness on a rainy night, but he basically had no idea where he was, as he'd been in such a hurry to leave the Seattle-Tacoma airport, he hadn't even bothered to specify a route for them to take and just left it up to the pilots. Furthermore, the parachute he'd taken with him was non-steerable, meaning that even if he did manage to see where he was through such poor visibility, he'd have no way of controlling where he'd land. Later during the investigation, Police would interview expert skydivers who stated they did not believe it was possible to survive a jump like this. Regardless, a massive manhunt was soon underway. Police scoured the area they believed the jump had occurred, conducting searches on foot and in the air. Patrol boats were also sent up and down Lake Merwin, and door-to-door -door searches of local farms were conducted as well. No trace of Cooper or the money was found and due to the time of year it was, most of the area was frozen, which meant a thorough search would have to wait until the following spring. When the spring thaw came, the FBI launched what was probably the most costly and extensive manhunt in US history. Several teams of agents were sent out to search the vast stretch of land, aided by 200 soldiers who were brought in from nearby Fort Lewis, along with countless National Guardsmen and civilian volunteers. They spent the better part of March and April searching tirelessly for any signs of Cooper, but again, nothing was uncovered. A search was also done for any missing persons or former convicts with the initials DC, hoping that Cooper had possibly used his actual initials when he signed for his plane ticket, which of course he hadn't. This led to a famous mishap in the press when police interviewed a person of interest from Oregon named D.B. Cooper. Officers quickly eliminated him as a suspect, but a local news reporter accidentally confused his name with the name of the hijacker. This error led to a domino effect where several publications, including the Associated Press, started printing stories calling the hijacker D.B. Cooper. The name stuck with the public, and the rest as they say is history. A list of serial numbers was sent by the FBI to casinos, racetracks, or any other spot someone may attempt to launder a large amount of cash, with attempts at recovering any of the money proving unsuccessful. A break came in 1980, though, when a child named Brian Ingram found three bundles of the ransom money on a beachfront named Tina Barr as he vacationed with his family. The bills themselves had dramatically deteriorated, but the rubber bands holding the bundles together were still intact. The FBI examined the money and determined it was in fact part of the ransom, and was still stacked in the same order it had been when they handed the cash over to Cooper. The rest of the area was thoroughly searched, but no other money was found. Experiments began to determine how the money had ended up there. Initial findings suggested that based on the decay patterns of the bills, it was more likely it had fallen into a nearby river and floated downstream before landing on the beach. Later findings disputed this though, as tests done with the rubber bands used on the money showed they would have broken down long before they were discovered by Brian if they had indeed fallen into the river as suggested. Meaning, it was more likely they had been buried there after the fact. Now, of course this doesn't necessarily prove Cooper survived the jump, 
as someone could have possibly found the money and kept it buried there for safekeeping, only to pass away later or forget where they'd left it before they could come back for it. This also raised a problem over who would get the money. Brian had found it fair and square, but the insurance company for Northwest Airlines, who ended up paying most of the ransom, felt they were entitled to some of it as well. After extensive negotiations, the money was split evenly between both parties, with the FBI taking a small share to keep as evidence. Mr. Ingram ended up auctioning off some of his shares in 2008 at an auction in Dallas, Texas, earning a handsome $37,000 for 15 of the tattered $20 bills. He apparently still has another 70 bills in his possession and hasn't indicated if he plans to sell them or not. But ironically, if he does and gets the same price, he'd end up making more money off a small portion of the ransom than Cooper did off the entire thing, all without having to skydive into a half-frozen forest. So good on you, Brian. In the months following the hijacking as the case gained more and more notoriety in the media, something happened that police weren't quite anticipating. Mr. Cooper became something of a celebrity. The public imagination was completely captured by the fearless plot he'd masterminded, and as opposed to the dangerous air pirate the FBI wanted to portray him as, Cooper was viewed as a Robin Hood type figure for many. People from Seattle particularly lauded his actions, as Boeing, one of the city's top employers, had laid off thousands the prior year, causing economic devastation throughout the city, making airlines not particularly popular with those who lived in Seattle at the time. So when this mysterious Mr. Cooper came along with his intricately laid plan and screwed over the villainous airline industry without hurting anyone else, Many saw that as something to celebrate. This was only the beginning of D.B. Cooper's enormous impact on pop culture. In the years since the hijacking, countless references to him have been made in film, TV, and music, including a line about him in the, and I cannot stress this enough, Grammy Award-nominated song Ball With The Ball by American artist Kid Rock. And as we all know, the ultimate measure of a person's impact on this world is getting Kid Rock to mention you in one of his songs. All jokes aside, the D.B. Cooper case is to this day one of the most talked about crimes in history, and fueling much of the allure and mystery behind all of it is the fact that Cooper was never caught. However, that isn't to say there's been any shortage of suspects throughout the years. During the five decades since 1971, thousands of people have been interviewed and investigated in hopes of finding the elusive Mr. Cooper. Police hoped to narrow down the search initially by creating a profile of him, but that proved difficult to do as there were a lot of conflicting facts about the man. On one hand, it seemed possible he was local, as he knew the area quite well and didn't speak with an accent according to any of the flight crew. On the other hand, he'd asked for his money in quote, negotiable American currency, which is an odd way to word it for someone from the United States. This led to some speculation he may have been from Canada, as their accents are often indistinguishable from American ones. There was also compelling evidence he had military experience, possibly as a paratrooper since he knew the location of McCord Air Force Base and possessed a deep knowledge of the Boeing 727-100, which was commonly used to make airdrops during the Vietnam War. This, however, was countered by some of the mistakes he'd made during the hijacking such as failing to take a steerable chute for his jump and neglecting to specify a route for the aircraft to take on its way to Reno so he'd have some kind of idea where he was before he made his perilous leap. It was also disclosed in 2007 that of the chutes he'd been provided, Cooper had taken the inferior older one to function as his primary and had failed to notice one of the parachutes given to him was a dummy used exclusively for training purposes, something a seasoned skydiver would have noticed almost immediately. Thus, the FBI concluded that they believed Mr. Cooper was not an experienced skydiver, but rather someone with an interest in aviation who had thoroughly researched the Boeing 727-100. 
Since the attempt to get a clear profile produced mixed results, the FBI had no choice but to pursue each lead that seemed remotely credible. This resulted in more suspects being investigated than I could possibly list in one video. But let's discuss a few of them that have popped up over the years. Kenneth Peter Christensen worked for Northwest Airlines. He'd enlisted in the Army during the Second World War and had been trained as a paratrooper, but fortunately for him had missed any fighting as he hadn't completed his training until after Japan's surrender. He was within the age group Cooper was believed to be in, and was even seen wearing a similar tie in a family photo. Despite him not looking much like the composite sketch, Florence Schaffner stated that of all the suspects she'd been shown pictures of over the years, Mr. Christensen was the one she felt matched Cooper the most. He'd spent the post-war years stationed in Japan with the Allied occupying force, during which time he completed several training jumps. In 1954, he got a job with Northwest Airlines as a mechanic and moved his way up to flight attendant before finally getting a job as a purser. Now, for those who don't know, a purser is an administrative official on an airline or cruise ship who is responsible for keeping track of all the money that comes in. Which was a bit ironic for him given that Northwest Airlines was notorious for underpaying their staff, leading to the workers' union frequently going on strikes. And it's easy to see how Kenneth could be a viable suspect. He worked at an airline where he was underpaid and underappreciated, yet his entire job revolved around keeping track of the massive profits Northwest was raking in on the backs of him and his co-workers. Mr. Christensen also easily had the training to make a jump like the one D.B. Cooper had attempted, and his military experience could have provided him with at least a service level understanding of explosive devices. It was discovered he'd purchased a home not long after the hijacking, and in 1994 as he was dying of cancer, he told his brother, quote, there's something you need to know but I cannot tell you. After he passed away, his family discovered an expensive coin and stamp collection in his home, as well as over $200,000 in a savings account. All of this sounds really convincing until you dive into it further though. For starters, yes, Mr. Christensen was horrendously underpaid by Northwest Airlines, but according to co-workers and friends, he didn't seem very bitter or angry about this. During union meetings, he was more likely to just sit in the back and let everyone else argue as opposed to being on the front lines of the discussion. It also seems unlikely he would attempt to hijack an airline he worked at, as the risk of someone recognizing him would be considerably high. Secondly, the house he'd purchased wasn't paid for in cash despite rumors to the contrary, but was mortgaged and paid off over a 17 year span. As far as the money in his savings account, Kenneth had apparently sold a large amount of land just before his death that was worth over $17,000 an acre. Furthermore, despite Ms. Schaffner's comments that she thought he looked like Cooper, it had been years since the hijacking when she first saw a picture of him, and it's impossible to expect someone's memory about an event to be clear 20 plus years after it happened. His deathbed confession was so vague he honestly could have been referring to anything. And to be quite frank, people claiming to be D.B. Cooper on their deathbed became such a common occurrence, it's basically a running joke among people who closely follow the case. The FBI ruled him out as a suspect, citing the lack of physical similarities and their belief that Mr. Christensen's experience as a trained paratrooper meant he wasn't likely to make the same mistakes Mr. Cooper had. William J. Smith was a World War II veteran who'd served in the Navy and completed combat aircrew training. After his discharge, he'd gotten a job working with the Lehigh Valley Railroad, a massive network of railways located in the heart of Pennsylvania's coal country. In 1970, Lehigh's parent company, Penn Central Transportation, filed what at the time was the largest corporate bankruptcy in U.S. history, leaving thousands of workers with no job and lost pensions, one of which was Mr. Smith. It was believed this made him very angry toward the transportation industry and corporate America in general. 
William matched the physical description of Cooper and would have been 43 years old in 1971, putting him well within the hijacker's age range. Pictures of the elderly Mr. Smith also bore a striking resemblance to the FBI's age-progressed sketch of D.B. Cooper. It was theorized that, with William's background, he could not only have made the jump from the plane, but swiftly located a railway to escape on after he landed. Lastly, and most interesting of all in my opinion, an analysis of Cooper's tie discovered tiny particles of aluminum and titanium. Police suspected this was a sign Mr. Cooper maybe worked at one of Boeing's aircraft facilities, but Mr. Smith could also easily have gotten these medals on his tie from his job as a yardmaster working at Lehigh's repair facility. William passed away in 2018 and was brought up as a person of interest a short time later in an article by The Oregonian, a newspaper based out of Portland. The article drew its information from the research of an anonymous data analyst for the U.S. Army, who submitted his findings to the FBI just before William's death. And while this theory is certainly a compelling one, the evidence for it is entirely circumstantial with everything hinging on the findings of a data analyst who, as of now, has yet to reveal his identity. So it's safe to say you should probably take this one with a huge grain of salt. Lastly, and certainly not least, Richard McCoy Jr., my personal favorite of the D.B. Cooper suspects. Not because I'm particularly convinced he was Cooper, but because he easily has the most batshit crazy story out of any of the suspects. And since this was a man who seemed hell-bent on doing everything bigger and better than Mr. Cooper had, I figured what better way to tell his story than to have a bigger and better channel than my own come in and do it for me. So, without further ado, please welcome Kenny, my good friend and one half of the excellent YouTube channel Strangeland. Take it away. What's up everybody, my name is Kenny, I'm from Strangeland, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Richard Floyd McCoy Jr. McCoy Jr. was a suspect in this case, and for very good reason. Four and a half months after D.B. Cooper hijacked his airplane, McCoy committed an incredibly similar crime. McCoy was born in Kinston, North Carolina, and he was 30 years old at the time of his crime. He grew up in Cove City, which is about 35 miles or so south of Greenville. Also. Cove City is known for possum races, so he would be enrolled at Brigham Young University, but he wouldn't finish. Instead, he dropped out and served in the Army. He was awarded a Purple Heart in 1964 after serving in Vietnam as a pilot and a demolition expert. This background would obviously serve good purpose for what he was planning on doing in the future. Now, how many times was he planning on committing this crime? Once, or maybe twice? On April 7, 1972, a Boeing 727 was being filled with 85 passengers and a crew of six, which was piloted by Captain Jerry Hearn. This was Flight 855 with United Airlines, going to Los Angeles, California from New York, New Jersey. This 727 had aft stairs in the back, just like D.B. Cooper. Also just like D.B. Cooper, McCoy gave instructions to the crew of the airplane. These instructions ordered a $500,000 ransom and a parachute. He was also carrying a pistol, which was not loaded, and a fake hand grenade. And there's a lot of talk about whether or not D.B. Cooper survived, but the thing about it is McCoy did. McCoy parachuted out of the aircraft through the aft stairway just like D.B. Cooper. He landed and survived, and was picked up by a motorist while he was hitchhiking near a restaurant. The driver ended up calling the police, saying he picked up someone wearing a jumpsuit who also had a large duffel bag with him. And also, by this time, word had spread about the hijacking, so now pretty much everyone in the areas knew what had happened. And one person that was friends with McCoy went to the police and told them that McCoy had told him how easy it would have been for him to commit a crime like this. And so now they had McCoy's name, and two days after the hijacking, McCoy was actually working on National Guard duty, flying a helicopter that was searching for the hijacker. He was arrested and the FBI found the jumpsuit and cash in his house. Now he claimed his innocence even to the point where he gave them handwriting samples and fingerprint samples to try to prove his innocence. 
But obviously this backfired, and he was convicted and given a 45 year prison sentence. So with everything that really happened in his crime, I think it's easy to understand why McCoy was also immediately looked at as a suspect in the D.B. Cooper case. He committed the exact same crime, and he had technically got away with it. I mean, he didn't, but he survived the jump, which is one of the big questions in the D.B. Cooper case. Now, of course, there are differences, and it seems like McCoy had much more of an experience doing something like this. We knew that he had jumping experience, also pilot experience from the army, and something I forgot to mention, after his time in the army, he became an avid skydiver. So he had plenty and plenty of experience in doing this, and he probably knew exactly how to do it. D.B. Cooper could have been someone else without that experience, or it could have also been McCoy, who survived to try it again. Because why not? He did it once, right? McCoy was incarcerated at a federal penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. And this next part is nuts. He was able to gain regular access to the prison's dental office, and that allowed him to steal a bunch of dental paste. With this paste, he made a fake handgun. With three other convicts, he was able to escape prison on August 10, 1974. They took a garbage truck, crashed it through the front gate of the prison, and were gone. Two of the other convicts were found within a few days, but McCoy and a third was not with them. He would not be found for three months. When he was found, he was in a house in Virginia Beach. The FBI had located his whereabouts and were waiting for him inside the house. He wasn't going to go down without a fight, and he opened fire. It was a shootout between McCoy and three FBI agents. The third convict that was with McCoy still was named Melvin Dale Walker. The shootout led to the death of McCoy, and Dale Walker attempted to get away from the agents in their car. He failed, and only after a short car chase, he was apprehended. So in 1991, a book was released called D.B. Cooper, The Real McCoy, which was written by two FBI agents. Now, both these agents had investigated McCoy's case, and they had come to the conclusion that McCoy and Cooper were definitely the same person. The book also claimed that McCoy's widow had a, a lot to do with the hijacking, and this would cause McCoy's widow to sue the publishers of the book. She attempted to prohibit further sales of the book, but that was denied. However, the prohibit of the sale of the movie rights to the book, that was actually granted. So a movie cannot be made from this particular book. On top of suing the publisher of the book, she also sued her former attorney, Thomas S. Taylor, which she claims he misrepresented her involvement in the hijacking. Now in 1994, settlements were made and accepted. The book's publisher ended up paying Karen McCoy $20,000, and her former attorney, Taylor, was ordered to pay her $100,000. The author's settlements are confidential, so we're not entirely sure what the authors of the book ended up paying her. Now. Under first examination, when you first read about his case, it may seem very plausible that he had something to do with it or that he was indeed D.B. Cooper because they're so similar. But it was only four months after D.B. Cooper hijacked his airplane that McCoy did his. And to me, it seems much more likely that McCoy was a copycat. It doesn't seem like they're the same person. Uh, for a couple different reasons, but it just seems like McCoy, who by the way, was having some financial issues, looked at the D.B. Cooper hijacking and thought, hey, I can do that. I have the experience to do that, and I know that I can get away with it. Now he was correct about a lot of it, right? He knew how to hijack the plane, and he knew how to survive jumping out of it. Uh, he just didn't know how to keep his mouth shut to his friend. He didn't really have a good idea of what to do after he landed and survived the jump. He didn't execute anything after the crime very well, except for escaping from prison, but he was caught. Thanks for having me on this episode. Check out our channel if you want. I'm handing it back to my partner in crime with this case, the man himself, Mr. Crime Spot. Later. Thanks a lot, Kenny. Now, for what it's worth, I'm in agreement with my colleague here. I think it's much more likely that McCoy was a copycat rather than the man himself. But honestly, anyone who's capable of making a fake gun out of dental paste deserves a spot in this video. So that's just three of the many, many suspects that were investigated over the years by the FBI. And despite the countless time and money poured into this investigation, D.B. Cooper's true identity has never been discovered. 
The last good physical evidence from the FBI came in 2001 when a partial DNA sample was recovered from Cooper's tie. Ironically, the cigarette butts collected from the plane, which would have been a much richer source of DNA, were discarded in the years since. There was also the problem of proving that the DNA profile even belonged to Cooper, as it could have easily gotten there from one of the passengers seated next to him or someone he bumped into at the airport. So even if a match was made, it probably wouldn't prove much in a court of law. In 2009, a group of self-proclaimed citizen sleuths led by Thomas Kay, a paleontologist at the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture, was assembled to take a second look at all of the FBI's evidence. This group was the one who discovered the metal fragments on Cooper's tie, and to this day they are still working to find new leads in this long cold case. In 2016, the FBI officially suspended the investigation into D.B. Cooper, citing the need to reallocate their resources into other cases, ending what they described as, quote, one of the longest and most exhaustive investigations in our history. And honestly, this was probably a smart move. They are still accepting any new evidence someone may want to bring forward, but at this point it's unlikely Cooper will ever be identified. And while the investigation into him may be done, his legacy in American mythos will likely live on forever. Before you go, I just want to mention a couple of more things. First, if you've watched all the way to the end, thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. I know this is easily the longest video we've ever made, so if you've managed to sit through the entirety of it, we greatly appreciate you. This is a case I've wanted to cover ever since we first started the channel, so I really, really hope you guys enjoyed it. Second, I want to thank Kenny from Strangeland for lending his talents to us for this video. If you haven't seen their channel, a link will be available in the description and I highly recommend you check it out. It's easily one of my favorite channels on YouTube, and Kenny, along with his partner Stefan, do such a great job breaking down all of the stories they cover in a fun, thorough, and engaging way. Lastly, if you want to hear more about the story of D.B. Cooper, I'm going to recommend two other videos. The first being the absolutely excellent Search for D.B. Cooper by YouTuber Lamino, a man whose presentation skills are on a completely different plane of existence from almost anyone else on the platform right now. And the second one being the HBO documentary The Mystery of D.B. Cooper. This includes interviews with several surviving crew members of Flight 305, who describe the events of that November night in stunningly vivid detail. And if you find this case as interesting as I do, it is 100% worth your time to watch. We've also recently reached 3,000 subscribers on our channel, which is unbelievable considering we didn't even have 200 a month ago. You guys are an amazing audience, and we appreciate every one of you so much. We really hope you continue to enjoy our content, and promise to do our best to keep making videos you find enjoyable. With that being said, if you're interested in true crime, criminal justice history, or mysterious stories from around the world, consider hitting that subscribe button below so you can be updated whenever we post something new. This is Crime Spot, and thank you for watching. Boom, 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 boom.